Hey, Trevor Matthews here. Good morning with another morning coffee with Trevor. I'm your host, Trevor Matthews, and uh, we're going to talk about some refrigeration today and have a good cup of coffee. Once again, I have my Americano here and my Yeti cup, and uh, it's going to be a great day. I see a lot of uh, people starting to join. Good morning. Yeah, so the last few days, we talked about a few different topics, mostly on mechanical failures, um, mechanical issues on compressors. And uh, today we'll probably get into more on the electrical side because I think that's one of the things where you'll see a lot of uh, misdiagnosis. Even me, for many, many years, I, I didn't understand the different types of electrical failures that, that could happen and uh, what causes them. And even, even now, to be honest with you, I'm still learning about different electrical failures because like I said many, many times, those electrical failures are caused by usually a mechanical issue. Aaron, what's happening? Good, good morning. Sorry, I'm a mess. Good morning. Good to see you, Trevor. Awesome. Good to see you, too. You getting all ready for today? Yeah, got class in about an hour. Got, uh, it's finals week, so it's uh, really uh, awesome. got a lot of work to do, but we got the students are doing great. Awesome. Finals week. Yeah, I remember I remember those times. I've done that a few times, and it's... Uh, so for the students, it's definitely a bit of a stressful time, but hopefully they're prepared and ready um, and uh, feel confident going into the, the tests and procedures. Do you guys do both practical and theory, theory exams for your uh, finals? Or is the, it finals is, the finals is a theory exam. Uh, some of them are written, some of them are multiple choice, but we do have every class, we have very detailed hands-on projects that they have to complete also to pass the class. Awesome. Awesome. Good morning, everyone else. Good morning, Brett, D, Donald, Noah. How are you guys all doing? Man, I just rolled out of bed. Oh, wow. I, I'm honored. You rolled out of bed and you turn, turned this on. I love it. I See, wonder during the conversation, face. brother. That a boy. That a boy. So talking about electrical failures. We're going to get into electrical failures today because um, we did talk about contamination overheating, flood of starts, flood backs, uh, loss of oil. We didn't really talk too much about slugging, but slugging is a part of either flood back or flood at starts. And anytime you pull open a compressor and you see smash scroll sets, you see smash pistons, rod, crankshaft, whatever it is, that is usually due from a slug. And that slug is from oil or liquid refrigerant. And it can happen really in two ways. So if it's air cool compressor, so an air cool compressor for uh, Copeland is you'll have two, uh, the discharge and suction rate on the head and you have uncontrolled uh, oil or uncontrolled liquid making it back to the cylinders, the, the pistons, and um, really it's going to smash the valve. So you're, you're trying to compress that oil, you're trying to compress that liquid. For air cool compressors, now it's that flooded start so that anytime that migration happens, that compressor fills up with refrigerant and you have an explosion of refrigerant and oil, and that'll get up into the, the pistons, brake rods and uh, reeds, whatever. And uh, that's really what causes a slug. So flooded starts is refrigerant cool compressors. Flood back is uh, air cool compressors. Sean, what's shaking, brother? How are you doing this morning? Oh, just hanging out, buddy. Hanging out, see what's going on. Oh, awesome. Well, hopefully you enjoyed your weekend. And Sean is a good friend of mine here. And he's uh, just started out in um, New Brunswick Community College there as a lead instructor. instructor. And uh, I, I'm really happy uh, that you made it out there, man. And you're going to have a lot of fun. It's a great school. Great people. Uh, which goes where I did my apprenticeship, where I did my pre-employment in 1990. So it's a full circle now. I came back home and go back to where I started. Well, you got a lot of knowledge to share, right? And you've been out there. Sean worked everywhere across North America for sure. He's done hundreds and hundreds of uh, supermarket installs and uh, commissionings, control commissionings, like real leader um, on the teams he's worked with. So uh, thanks, thanks for showing up, Sean. No problem. Okay, so, so we're going to talk a little bit about electrical failures and um, how they happen and what, what causes them. So one of the big things is, and I've seen this happen before, is uh, improper installation, 
where um, I've even had it happen where I got a compressor from a supply house or a wholesaler and I didn't check, didn't check the voltage of it, bring it to a site, threw it in, didn't look at it really quickly, put it on, turn it on, and it was the wrong voltage compressor. And that can happen very easily. Uh, it only happens once for sure. After that, you're checking every time, but it can happen. Another thing is like voltage. You know, you're getting the wrong voltage. It can be a loose wires. Um, the, different, the different types of electrical failures that you can have, you can have single phase burn, uh, which is really where uh, it, it's a lot of times where you're running into an issue with a contactor where you could have a contactor welded, like two of the phases welded, and uh, you just keep getting current going through that uh, compressor winding. So you get, um, and it overloads those winding. So what you want to do is check the, the terminals, check that contactor. That's why it's always important to replace that contactor. You know, or if you check from the contactor, it could be the contactor that's the issue. Um, you always want to check the electrics from the, the compressor. Some people call it the pecker head, the electrical terminals, pull off that uh, insulator. I, I say this all the time because I know not enough technicians know you got to pull off that electric, uh, term, uh, terminal in, insulation terminal and check it right from those uh, lugs on the compressor. It could be unbalanced of voltage that causes it as well. And these are the things that you need to check. If you're going to, yeah, say you have a 230 volt compressor and you go from one leg, it's 222, 222, and then 223 on one, but then you got all of a sudden you get 200 on another one or 198 on one. What's going on? What, why, is, why do you have such a drop in voltage? So you need to check that. Check for blown fuses on, on single phase uh, burns. Then you have half winding burns um, and really half winding burns. Uh, you can see from uh, once again, single phasing. So part of that winding uh, has a burn and you can really see this is when you pull off the end bell of like a semi hermetic and you'll look at it and you can see actually the copper, like the windings, they're a different color. They're a different color. They can be burnt and the other windings look normal. Like they look like they're proper color. Um, if you have the whole thing that's burnt, that's usually called a general winding burn. You can also have um, half winding single phase burns. So this is where you have uh, part winding start. And part winding start is when you have two contactors. One pulls in and then like uh, less than a second later, a second one pulls in. So this is really to reduce your wire size, reduce your contactor size, reduce your uh, amperage on the startup. Because if you have just one contactor, you need bigger wires, bigger contactors, and more load in that one uh, when that compressor turns on. So it's real good to understand that. Will you see it a lot? I, I know in the US, uh, they've used a lot more part winding start, I believe, than here. Uh, I've seen some of them, but uh, the last, I, I say, when I was just finishing the field, all the last stores I was installing, they were all uh, single contact. There's not many part windings. How about you guys? You see much part winding starts out there? Systems? Down in the cities, down in like Philadelphia, uh, Chicago, anywhere where they you know, want to basically uh, kind of cheat the system and not have to run, uh, you know, a bigger wire for the inrush. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and, and that's what it's for. It needs to be set up properly. It needs to be wired properly. And you need to understand that um, because I think the first time I walked into a store and as I was actually pulling it out, we were doing a reno and I looked in and then all of a sudden I have two contents. I'm like, what? And then, then it goes to one compressor. I'm like, what is this? Like, how does this work? Um, but if you look at the back of the, the Copeland compressor, you pull the terminal cover off, it'll show you, let's just say if it's on a 40 or 60, it'll have how to wire that up. And I think that's something else that a lot of technicians miss. Even me, I miss that, is that behind those plates, if the, it's still there, there's the wiring diagram, how to wire that compressor up. Uh, same with on the scrolls, it's harder to see now because it's, um, they have uh, embedded it into the plastic so it can be difficult to see compared to when it was pa uh, paper. Other, other uh, electrical issues you can see is uh, primary single phase burns, start winding burns is where, where you'll see this, the start winding's gone and that will happen in single phase compressors where you get an issue with your start cap. It doesn't go out of the system. You want that to drop out. That, 
that start uh, capacitor, but if it doesn't, you can get a start wind and burn. Then you have a run, run, run winding burn. Um, and once again, if you open up these compressors, you can see on actually those are stators, the condition of it. And all these can be due to a ton of different things. You know, you could have loose connection. You could have bad voltage. You can have uh, the wrong wire size, right? All these different things. And as a technician, when you run into an issue, you need to look at all these different things. And, and I didn't, I'll tell you right now, I didn't even at the first seven or eight years, I, if I had a failed compressor, I kind of, okay, I had a loose connection here. You know, I had a loose wire on, if I couldn't find anything and I did everything and I started up the new compressor and it was a hermetic, you didn't, you couldn't open it up and yeah, you know, find a loose wire. I think this was, was causing the chatter of the contactor for an example. And if that happens, okay, that's okay. It probably could happen, but was that exactly the problem? Unless you look inside, you check that, that motor, that stator, it's hard to, to be exact unless you can confirm that. Okay. And I've heard it before. I've walked in the room and I'd hear chattering contactors, good voltage drop on the control voltage somehow. You got to figure that out. What's causing that voltage drop? So that compressor contactor pull in. Anybody have any uh, stories they want to share about electrical issues on compressors? Yeah, I'll share the one that I direct connected you with. Um, uh, about two years ago and a year ago, we had um, a run. I say a run, this has only happened twice, um, where basically a brand new compressor right out the gate had, would, would run for about, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds and then trip off an internal overload. It was about both 3D compressors. Uh, basically, superheat was good. I had about 40 to 45 degrees of superheat. Uh, temperature of the compressor was good. It had an internal overload uh, that was, you know, setting on the stator, um, you know, on the 3Ds because they don't have the motor protectors. And I couldn't figure out why this damn thing was tripping. RLA was supposed to be uh, 43 amps on a 208 3D compressor. And it just kept opening up every 20, 30 seconds. Um, come to find out, I, you know, I finally pumped down the compressor. I open up the compressor. I take the pecker head off. I take the, the, the plate that's, on, that's mounted on there with the 516 screws. And lo and behold, I checked the part number in the good old electrical blue book that Emerson or the Copeland had. And come to find out, I had a 575 volt overload and a 230 volt compressor. And basically, it was because a 575 volt compressor obviously is going to have way lower amperage than, you know, than your 208. And I mean, like I said, I've, I've seen that happen twice in my life, not saying that it can't happen, you know. Yeah, uh, no, that's a great find. And it does happen. It does happen because these compressors are put together uh, by people, right? And it, mistakes can be happen. They can pull, they have great uh, quality control. Like all these lead manufacturers have amazing quality control, you know, but it still uh, can happen human error. Like if you pull, they pull from the wrong bin, it doesn't what, man, what ma uh, manufacturer it is even all the process they have, there still can be a bit of error happen. And so, yeah, they probably pulled from the wrong bin by accident or some, someone put it in a bin by accident and, and put the wrong thing in. And it, does, and it does happen, but that's a great find. Like uh, most technicians wouldn't have drove that deep into it. <clears throat> they would have just said it's a DOA compressor, dead on arrival or it didn't work from startup. And then that will be it. Don't look any deeper, but as a technician, you need to do what Brett just said. You need to go a little further to get that understanding of what caused that failure. And when you do, it's going to give you more insight on why you have issues with compressors and not just say, oh, it's just a DOA compressor. Let's get another one, throw it in. And then Bob's your uncle, you're on your, to your next job. You want to figure this out. And that's where you become a better technician is when you dive in a little deeper, you find out that exact problem. And then you can come and talk confidently to the customer about it. You can talk confidently to your boss or your service manager about it. And then you will have more confidence in the field as a technician. When you start solving these hard problems and diagnosing these problems that other technicians can't find, you are going to feel more confident when you're out there troubleshooting. And uh, that's really, uh, it takes a long time. It doesn't happen overnight. Even now, I, I need to work at my troubleshooting skills. I, I study more. I work with lots of 
great experts out there, but I still got a lot to learn, right? And uh, you just got to keep investing in yourself to get better. Anyone else have some uh, electrical troubleshooting uh, examples? Okay, if we're talking about single phase compressors, I know a lot of a lot of my career I worked on three phase stuff. I did work on quite a bit of single phase stuff, but mostly on three phase stuff. You have to be aware about the proper components that go with that compressor. And I've seen this before. I had I've done lots of uh, field service calls. I had friends call me up and say, Trevor, I'm working on this AC unit, this residential unit, and the compressor is just humming or it starts up and it just it dies out and when it's running it's fine well, what's going on so when you are checking a single phase compressor make sure you have the right components you always need to replace those electrical components anytime single phase i don't it doesn't matter if you test them and they are good um, because they can actually if you have them out of the system and you check them they can check good but when they're running in the system, they don't work properly. I've seen this um, before firsthand and, uh, and it happens. So I didn't uh, know until a few years ago how to check it, um, say the microfarads while the system's running. So there is an equation to do it. Um, I don't know it off the top of my head, um, but I've done it while it was uh, a system was running to check those microfarads. But what you need to do is go into the compressor manufacturer, the, that compressor that you're working on, and find out what the specific start cap for that compressor is. Because I've seen this many, many times. People go and or they have a bunch in their truck, and there are maybe different microfarads. They'll put it in wired up or put the wrong voltage one in there. You always can put a higher voltage in, so not lower voltage, but you need to have that right microfarad. Uh, these are a high starting torque start capacitors there's low starting torque and high starting torque and really what the difference is is a price so my understanding is manufacturers will put low starting torque uh ones in because of the price but when you go to buy them from the wholesaler like what copeland puts on their um in copeland mobile will be the high starting torque one to make sure it turns over and the runs but if you ever do uh check a compressor and it has that wrong uh, start cap, that could be your issue. So I've definitely replaced single phase compressors uh, because of electrics. I went in, it's humming, had my gauges on, my amp clamp check, I got voltage there, how come it's not running? And it's, mm, you know, it's just humming and try a few different things, uh, compressor dead. Come to find out, I didn't check the start capacitors and I get back there with a new compressor, put the new compressor in, think I do the great, the great job, flick the switch on again, and it's still humming. So you do that once, and then all of a sudden, you're not gonna do it again. So single phase compressors, replace those start components. Make sure the start components are also in the proper direction too, right, Trevor? Um, the yeah. start relays are, you know, they, they have uh, on there, it should say top, you know, pointing on which which direction the part of the relay should be should be set. And, you know, if it's not followed or not looked at, you know, what can happen is, you know, the start relay will basically fail after a couple of starts. And, you know, like you said, you know, someone will go out there, replace the start components, but then they really never look into what actually happened to it. And I've seen this multiple times with kids, you know, they'll end up putting in uh, new stuff and, you know, basically not watch the way that they installed that relay. And then potentially cause that that relay to fail multiple times. Yeah, no, exactly. There is a direction on on definitely some start components. Um, you really need to make sure you're checking that that start warning uh, kicks out. So you check your potential relay if it has one of those. And uh, the way it works, it takes back uh, voltage, back EMF, whatever, and it'll open and cut out that start whining. If it doesn't cut out that start whining, you're gonna lead to a, you know, a start whining burn on those compressors. And it's important that you check this stuff out and take your time to understand it. Electrics is one of the hardest things on, in uh, refrigeration. The troubleshooting electrics, because it can be overwhelming. I walked into my first few stores when I first started doing service and I walk into a rack room and there's 
a bunch of racks, uh, nothing running and my heart pumping and, and uh, what's going on. You know, you open up the doors and there's thousands of wires. So right off the bat, you're super overwhelmed. And it took me years and years and years of, you know, working at it to be like, okay, let's just break this down into compartments. This is, yes, there's lots of wires, but where do I start? Well, let's start at the main wire power coming in. Do I have main power coming in? You know, does that, you know, does the contactor have power on the, the um, uh, inlet side? So uh, do you have power coming into the contactor? Okay, I got power coming in. Is the contactor pull in? No. Okay, do I have power to the coil at all? Oh, I don't have power to the coil. Do I have power on the low side? And you need to be safe. When you're working with electrical, I can't stress this enough. You need to be safe. You need to think before you start touching stuff. You need to shut power down, lock stuff out if you have to. At the end of the day, you, if you're hurt, you can't work. If you're dead, you can't work. So you need to be safe. You want to go home to your family. So think before you touch anything, right? Always wear the proper PPE. When you're when you're troubleshooting it's so important and if you don't understand something step back and either ask somebody call your service manager up call a lead technician up to get a better understanding one of the things that i found that i didn't understand and it took many many years until i started reading the books is understanding my electrical um my uh, electrical meter there's so much information in say on a fluke meter I had a bunch of fluke meters over the years. I had amp probes. I had a few other ones, but take the book out once in a while and, and check it out. Also test your meter, make sure you test your meter. You know um, it's so important to see if it's even working properly because you could go up to something. I've always used two. like when I'm working with high voltage, I would always use my meter and I would have like a, you know, electrical probe just to see if there's electric, but I'd always test with my meter afterwards just to make sure double checking if that those wires were, were, uh, had no power going through them. So if you ever pull the compressor apart and, uh, it's the oil smelled really bad as black, um, chances are high that it's from an electrical burn. Uh, it can be, uh from real high heat but usually it's from an electrical burn and that electrical burn could be from a few of the things that we talked about it could be an issue with the contact it could be an issue with the power it could be an individual with the um line to line power and it's very important to uh just understand um what you are troubleshooting at that time so the electrics so three phase compressors if it's part winding start or not, um, and understand the voltage you should begin, understand what should the wire size be. I've seen this before where the wrong wire size was put on a piece of equipment. Okay, and as a technician, you don't really think of that. You think, oh, I just bought this million dollar piece of equipment or whatever, my customer bought this uh, equipment, it should be all correct. Sometimes there's mistakes that happen. And same with wiring diagrams. Verify the wiring diagrams. And if it looks right on the wire diagram, the only way to tell if it's exactly the same is go look at it. Because I'm I know this, I've seen this, and I've talked to so many technicians where I ran into issues where I spend two hours chasing my tail to come to find that the electrical wire diagram is wrong from the, the OEM that that developed the equipment. So definitely check that stuff. Ooh, a lot of talking there. Any other, anybody else have any other examples about electrical issues that they ran into? Okay. So I wanna thank everyone for joining uh, these sessions so far. I've been having a lot of fun. Uh, there's a lot of other topics that I'm gonna be bringing up um, each week, each day, I guess, for the next 25 more days, 26 more days. Uh, hopefully you're enjoying this stuff. If you do have any questions, you can shoot them on the, the YouTube channel, put them in, in the chat there. You can email me at Trevor at refrigerationmentor.com. And uh, hopefully you're learning one or two things from this. And uh, I know I'm learning uh, every day, every day since I've done this, I've learned something every day from somebody here. So I really appreciate your time. And uh, I'm going to enjoy my coffee. And if you guys have any questions, I'll sit here for a couple of minutes.
enjoy the rest of my coffee with you. Trevor, I got eight o'clock beans, fresh ground, and an electric percolator. There you go. That is a fantastic morning. That's a fantastic morning. Once again, I got my Americano here. Like, I uh, grounded it up, and yeah, it's enjoyable. One thing that I do the night before I, I do this, I get it all set up because uh, I the first day, I think I woke up my, all my kids because I had my grinder going off. So I'm working on trying to be a little bit more stealth in the morning. Yeah, I have to go down the other end of the house and grind the beans to not wake the kiddos up. But yeah, <laughs> back to your back to your voltage uh, troubleshooting thing. It, no matter what you change, a compressor and overload. Um, I had a technician call me once, say, hey, I, I got the both of these new compressors installed and they just go off on overload right away. And uh, they're pulling high amps. And I said, what, what's the voltage on this new compressors? And they said, ah, oh, rats, it's 208 or 230. And this is a 480 volt unit, you know, and that was a, a rough day um, yeah. to start that whole thing all over again. And, and on anything, I mean, a motor, we, we, we spent a whole day on an oil furnace before we realized we installed the wrong RPM pump. Uh, so anything, check all your numbers before you even leave the supply house. Yeah, that's very important. I get caught with that. Another thing about electrical that I didn't, didn't bring up is that external overloads on three-phase compressors, if you do not look at that wiring diagram, that overload connects the windings. And I've seen this so many times. That overload, if guys pull it off or technicians pull it off the fusites, the little terminals, and they check it from those terminals that connect all the windings are going to be open windings and i've seen when i worked at, at copeland i've seen many many compressors during trainings that we would check and they were totally fine and but we'd noticed the overloads pulled off so that's one thing that you should check as a technician is pull that overload off break it open see if it was tripping you can go down to the supply house and buy another one if you have to but that 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 there is something that i've seen many 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 times where the wires are pulled off. I know for sure they checked it from there. Oh, it's open. Uh, but really that external overload was tripped off on overheat or high amps. And, um, and they checked it. Uh, they were checking it while it was cooling. They were like, uh, or yeah, the overload was open. Oh, it's open right now. They pull it off, check for there. Oh, the windings are, are open. But really the windings weren't open. It was just that external overload open so this is something that you need to think of and there's lots of other electrical things that we can talk about and we'll bring it up in other podcasts or other um, videos um, where like uh, 40 and 60 60 compressors will have you know internal ptc resistors inside there and as that temperature goes up they'll they'll change their uh, ohm rating and then the motor uh, oh, protector will Shut, the, shut that compressor down to protect it from the electric. So these are things that you need to learn. It takes time. You got to figure out the compressors you're working on and understand them, all the different parts and components that could be on them. They're not always on there either. Like not all those parts are always on there. So it's important to figure out over time and doesn't happen have to happen overnight, but over time, figure out all these different parts that could potentially be on um, those compressors. Trevor, what are your thoughts on bypassing those if a compressor is, let's say, 15 years old and, you know, you're just trying to get this thing back up and running. You don't want to jump out the whole module, but you have the option to basically, you know, utilize a X ohm resistor in order to get that compressor back up and running. You know, you still have the protection of the other two. Uh, you know, the, you know the, there's no evidence of overheating. It just simply failed. You know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely do that. It's 2200 ohm, I think one or two watt resistor. Um, definitely do that. But this is where a conversation you need to have with your customer because if one, if that one failed, who knows the other ones? So it's a good time to be proactive. Get them up and running. You need them up and running, but you need to replace that compressor. I highly recommend that. It, they say that you can bypass the one, um, and but the, if you have two, uh, we've seen it, multiple ones bypass. You don't want to do that. Uh, cause you're caught, you're risking your customer's, uh, product, uh, your integrity as a technician. If one fails, you need to be working on proactively getting a new compressor in there. I would say be proactive with your customers. 
Okay. Well, thanks so much for everyone showing up and I will see you again tomorrow at another uh, morning coffee with Trevor. Thanks everyone.